awesome. Thanks. It's really nice to see so many friendly faces here tonight. Thank you so much for coming out. I have a very weak voice, so if any of you have trouble hearing me in the back, you might want to think about moving front. Um, and I'm sorry, it's something that I can really control. Um, it was a real delight to be asked to talk about the textile collection at the Historical Society. You have some really, truly amazing pieces. Although not all of it has good history with it and provenience, uh, it, it, there is a real coherence to it and a real, um, a real sense of place and a real sense of context for the people who lived here in, in western New York and Huntington Falls. Um, I love to talk to people about textiles. I think that we all relate to them in a very elemental way. We surround ourselves with textiles all day, every day. Well, most of us do it all day, every day. <laughs> Right? Um, and not only with our personal textiles and our clothing, but also just things in our homes and, and um, around us at, at work. And it's, um, it, there is such a wonderful tactile element to textiles that can comfort and can inform and can clearly express someone's personality and someone's um, someone's intent in life by what they choose to envelop themselves in. So um, I am a firm believer in that textiles and food history um, are some of our greatest indicators and some of our best ways to engage with other people about ourselves and about people from the past. So um, I hope you'll indulge me for the next little bit of time. Um, I said I would talk about five pieces. I think I pulled out nine. <laughs> Sorry about that. But they just all seemed to really, um, they all spoke to me, and they all just seemed to really um, go together very, very nicely. So I'm going to try to um, talk about the pieces and also a little bit about why they're special here to Honey Apple. So my dear friend Laura is going to hit my slides for me. So first slide, please. All right, one thing that I had no idea of when I'm, oh, I'm out of your, am I in anyone's way to see the screen? Oh, okay, good. Um, so one thing that I didn't know um, until just a couple weeks ago was that, although I was obviously aware that there were lots of mills in Honey Eye Falls, I did not know that there was a woolen mill here. And in fact, the Hunt Brothers woolen mill had two different locations and uh, was apparently fairly prominent. And we are very fortunate to have in our collection um, a, a blanket from the woolen mill that was, according to the owner, from um, Hunt's brother's woolen mill. Now that's always a little bit of a tenuous thing. You hope that the owner was telling you the truth. The donor would, it really did know that this thing was from that particular woolen mill, but we'll just take it for fact right now. As you can, and I should go back just for a moment, I do have these things out on the tables too that you'll be able to come and get a closer look at when we're done. Um, but up on the screen is a picture of this really beautiful pad blanket. It's not in terrific condition, not too surprising considering that it's wool. And it's probably, um, well, it's over 120 years old now. Um, but it's a really, it, it's so very um, indicative of its time. These sorts of plaids were very, very um, common. The blue, white, and cream, or the blue, red, and cream color scheme was extremely common as well. I honestly did not have much time to dig into Hunt's Wool and Mill. I don't know what other types of, um, of textiles they produced, but this one is a particularly nice example. Next slide. Their first mill was actually in West Bloomfield, and I'm sorry that this is a poor image of it. Some of you have probably seen a much clearer image of the same uh, photograph. It was located near Bean Hill Road and Ontario Street, right there. Um, and this image shows you clearly that there are three mills on the left-hand side of the creek, and there's two actually also on the right-hand side of the creek. So if you're looking from the left, the very first one is a grist mill owned by Aaron Mather. The center one is the Hunt Brothers Mill. And you might notice that there's a small building in front of the much larger building, and that was actually used for the dyeing of the textiles that they then wove into fabric. The third mill on the right is a sawmill owned by the Bond family. Now across the street, across the bridge, and this fascinates me, was a mill used to make carpenters augers. I mean, how much more specific can you get? We only make carpenters augers in this mill. Um, and apparently that building was still standing um, until the relatively recent past. And just off screen where you can't see it was a cider mill owned by John Idison. So it was a real definite industrial complex right there on the corner of uh, Dean Hill Road and Ontario Street. Next slide, please. 
Um, later, the mill moved uh, into the village of Honey Eye Falls, and according to Bill, was located near uh, what is now the, the water treatment plant, right? Um, and I believe that this building is that second mill, not the first mill. Um, I love this image. I'm sorry, it's a, it's a little bit faint right now, but um, the, the, the area for drying the textiles here in the front is really um, very, it, it, that's an interesting part of the industrial process to see in an image like this from this time period. Um, next slide, please. Oh, I'm sorry, go back. Or, or don't go. Which way? Go back. Sorry. I don't know if any of you can see this, but up in the second floor window, not, not the third floor one, but there's a, um, four women standing in the window. And I, don't, I don't know if they were weavers or if they were dyers or who they were, but I just think that's a wonderful image. Yes, please. Um, and this is just another image of the same mill. Apparently, um, apparently the Hunt brothers were involved in a lawsuit as well um, that when Rochester decided to, or wanted, started to inquire about getting uh, water from Hemlock and Kennedy's Lakes, um, the Hunt brothers were part of a lawsuit that tried to stop them from acquiring the water from those two lakes. Um, apparently the lawsuit lasted from 1880 till 87, and I'm assuming they lost because Rochester does get its water. <laughs> right, okay, one more slide for that. And these are the Hunt brothers. Um, what a wonderful image, isn't it? Yeah. So in the front is Elston, Frank, and William, and then in the back, Arthur, oh, I misspelled his name. Arthur, Sidney, and Barrett in the back. Um, they just look like the completely typical 1880s, 1890s um, rulers of industry, you know, right here in Honey Falls. That's, that's just a great, great image. All right, now we're going to start a dip into women's clothing because, you know, it's textiles. So this is a dress that belongs to the Historical Society, and it's one of those things that my, my colleague who is here tonight, George McIntosh, he and I at the Rochester Historical or Museum and Science Center would say, this was a drop and run. <laughs> this dress uh, turned up in a bag outside the Historical Society in the fairly recent past with no sense of its history or where it came from, which is so, so, so unfortunate. Um, we would like to believe that it was from the area. We would like to think that it was worn by someone who walked the streets of the village, um, but there's really no way to tell. What we can tell by looking at it is that it was a really very beautiful and very typical dress from about 1840 to 1845. Um, it's made of an extremely lightweight and, and almost sheer woolen fabric. Um, that's been printed in this wonderful purple. And, okay, it's not just that purple's my favorite color. This dress is great for other reasons as well. Um, some of the diagnostic characteristics that let us know that this is from the 1840s are the very pointed waistline, which you can see right there, um, and the fact that it's pleated all around. So, next slide, please. This is a photo of uh, obviously a different dress, but from the very same time period that has similar characteristics. You can see that it is very pointed in the front. The skirt is um, belled out, but it's not terribly large. We're certainly not looking at Civil War style big hoop skirt dresses at this time period. This is before um, um, the, the process of making the right kind of steel for cage crinolines was invented. So hoop skirts weren't even possible at this time. The woman who wore a dress like this uh, would have many, many layers on, including probably four or five petticoats. Some of them stiffened with cording um, and, and very, very heavily starched. Um, and it was the weight of all these petticoats that started uh, people thinking, hmm, maybe there's a better way to get the, the fullness and broadness that we want. Please. Um, these are just two detail shots. The left-hand shot shows the beautiful waistline, and the right-hand shot, if you can tell, shows the beautiful, really beautiful pleating in the back. And one more shot. And I'm sorry, I just love this fabric. <laughs> it's, um, it, it, the fact that um, from about the 1830s through about the 1880s, 1890s, these amazing printed wool fabrics were available in these incredibly fine and sheer weights. 
um, made these dresses, uh, allowed these dresses to be voluminous and flowy and beautiful in a way that no one who's making historic clothing today can replicate because this type of fabric just is not available anymore. This gown um, is a true treasure. It's probably the earliest outer garment, female outer garment, that you have in the collection. Unfortunately, it's not in terrific condition. Um, I don't think it could ever really be exhibited on a mannequin because of the uh, frailty of the shoulder areas. But it is a true treasure, and you all should be very pleased to be the caretakers of it. So now we're going to move a little bit. Yes? Would that, the previous dress, would that have been an expensive dress back then or an everyday dress? I think it would have been a day dress. Okay. Um, that, that quality of wool, even though it's not available today, was not uncommon and was not terribly expensive. Um, printed fabrics, printed textiles in the United States started to fall in price in the early 1830s because of all the uh, printing mills in New England. And um, so <coughs> the availability of the fabric was pretty common. This dress um, is a really <coughs> terrific example, and it's really in amazing condition. It probably dates to right around 1870, 1870, around the 1870s. And on this one, we actually know who wore it. If I can find it. Oh, did I not? Oh, Mary Ann Otis. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this was, this was uh, a dress owned by Mary Ann Otis, and I know that we have other things of hers on exhibit at the museum, and she was a, uh, the Otis family is fairly prominent in Honeyack Falls. Um, this, the, once again, the fabric of this dress is a really beautiful, um, little heavier weight wool, woven in a plaid. This is not printed, it's woven to be a plaid. Um, and the, the diagnostic features that let us know that it dates to the 1870s are the, um, the beautiful princess lines of this dress. There's no seam between the bodice and the skirt. So basically, this dress is all cut in one piece. It's cut in curved pieces so that it, it will fit her body when she's ready to put it on. And it just gives you a really lovely straight line from the shoulder to the hem. Um, these, dresses, these dresses in the 1870s were generally or often known as um, Natural, natural form dresses. We're starting to get away from those heavily, heavily, heavily corseted dresses of the 1860s, and we will yet still get to the more heavily corseted dresses of the 1880s. These dresses still had corsets under them, but they weren't, um, they weren't piles of ruffles and long trains and piles of fringe and trim. They tended to be um, slimmed down versions of, of styles that had come earlier. Um, can I have the next slide? This is a good example of one on a mannequin. Um, and you can see just how nice and slim and beautifully straight that line is. Or not straight, actually it's quite a nice um, hourglass. Um, generally the sleeves are fairly tight to the body. Um, your example has a little bit of a puff to the sleeve, which is a nice touch. Um, and generally the trim is very vertical um, because they're, they're following that princess line and following that, that vertical seam. Uh, your example has a little bit of a ruffle at the bottom, so it may be like not quite ex completely committed to the idea of natural form, but definitely heading in that direction. Excellent. And these are just two um, detail shots to show you more of the seaming of both the front and, and the back. All right, so, so yes, yeah, so we have this beautiful 1878 dress. I, um, I'm really curious to know what age Marianne Otis was when she wore this dress. Uh, it's really a beautiful example. And I also wonder if she made it here or if she brought it with her from wherever it was she came from. But it's definitely a beautiful example. Next slide. 1880, she was born here. 1880, she was at the Capitol born here. She came in 78, right? Yeah, because she, she married Otis and he came back, and got back in the Civil War. Okay. She was a she was, she was related to Downey Sword Downey's uh, store here in Missouri Falls. She was a niece. Cool. Um, so then I couldn't really resist doing something 20th century, although I don't normally dabble a lot in 20th century um, history. But 
You have a stunning, stunning 1930s beautiful party dress. And um, again, it's purple. Sorry, I just got that. <laughs> but this dress um, is in almost perfect condition. There, once again, there's no history with it. We don't know who wore it or who owned it or who made it or where they wore it. But hopefully they wore it here somewhere, um, uh, maybe for a beautiful um, New Year's Eve party or a beautiful Christmas party. Um, next slide. Um, it's very much a starlet dress, like the dresses in this uh, um, pattern advertisement. The lines were meant to be very sinuous. Oftentimes the fabric was extremely um, extremely soft and extremely uh, drapey, so a nice silk velvet was perfect for that. A lightweight silk velvet just drapes beautifully and flows beautifully around the figure. These dresses were often cut on the bias, so rather than having your pieces cut on a straight grain, mm -hmm. they were cut across a little bit, and that allowed it to flow even more beautifully. Um, and I think you can see that these seams are definitely on the bias as well, and that's, that's going to add to that sense of flow. That allows that nice flat hip and nice flat waist, and yet trumpeting out toward the bottom, or, or making such a beautiful tulip skirt toward the bottom. You often see these um, partially bare backs in the 1930s dress clothes, and we definitely see that in this dress as well. Next slide. Um, I know this is hard to see. I, my photography skills weren't great, but this is the front part portion, which uh, ends in a bow at the bodice. And this is the back, which has this really, this very same uh, V-shaped um, seaming that allows that beautiful shape. It's a stunning garment. It would look terrific on a mannequin. It would look terrific on me. But <laughs> <laughs> I really shouldn't say that. Okay, next. So um, you have a lot of quilts in, in, the, in the Historical Society collection. And not, not a ton of quilts, but several really, really nice quilts. And I was, when I came across this one in the collection, I was really intrigued. The idea of a, an autograph quilt or a signature quilt or a friendship quilt, they go by all three names, is not uncommon. And in fact, was extremely popular in the 1840s and 1850s and then hit another um, time of popularity between the 1880s and the 1890s. So the fact that you had one wasn't um, unusual. What's unusual about this one for me is the, is the really um, different um, way, it, way it's, uh, the, the, the different, I'm sorry, the different pattern. Um, this one almost looks like it's meant to be visiting cards or, or, or name cards. And I don't think I've ever seen that in another collection. It's almost as if um, the people who made it just put out their visiting cards in a pattern and, and then embroidered around them, and that's what they did. Um, the purpose of these types of quilts were often to give to someone who was leaving the community. So you'll often see them given to a pastor who leaves his church, or a family who leaves to go west, or um, a beloved teacher in a school. Um, they are often commemorative in that sense. Sometimes they're extremely elaborate, and um, sometimes they're, they're much, much plainer. I would say that this one is on the plain side, but it is, it's terribly intriguing because of, of the pattern that they have chosen. Um, next slide. There are a lot of um, look. There are a lot of local names on here. I've asked Diane was kind enough to um, start trying to look up some of the names in an effort to try to decide what the date of this quilt was, and um, she was able to identify some. And and uh, that might be a larger project in the long run. I was interested because working in Rochester to see the Elwanger family name show up on this quilt. Next one. I was also especially interested to see a surprise show up. Um, the Rochester Museum in, uh, has in our collection the Ace of Pride tin shop, or, or at least a lot of the product of the Ace of Pride tin shop, as well as his really beautiful tin tin shop sign. 
which has recently come off exhibit, but I was really happy to see um, his name there and the name of his family. A lot of these names do show up in sort of family groupings in these, um, in these uh, blocks. Um, there are also three clergymen on these blocks, and one of them I could find in the record, um, and that was James J. Levy, who was the pastor of St. Paul of the Cross from 1879 to 1888. Um, there was also a Reverend F. B. Miller and a Reverend L. C. Brew. Um, and they're all in the same block. And this kind of makes me think that it might have been made for someone who had been a pastor um, and was either moving on or retiring or something of that, um, of that ilk. Um, next slide. Um, these quilts take a lot of different forms. And this is a little bit of a, a slightly more traditional one. Um, and often, just as in the quilt at the Historical Society, family groups are listed together, um, just as all the pies are listed here. Um, and next one. And sometimes, some of my favorite autograph quilts don't have handwriting on them at all. They have stamps. And um, this one is a beautiful example um, that I just saw today. And it actually lists um, the names of three family members from Philadelphia on the same block. Um, and just as a matter of nomenclature, this, what we are calling this quilt isn't actually a quilt. It's actually a tied comforter. Um, quilts require that the backing and the front and the batting are all sewn together by layers of, by rows of stitching. And that's not the case with this one. Um, this one is actually just tied. So basically, they took a thread and yarn and put it through once and tied the ends off and then sometimes made like a little tassel, which is definitely what they did here in this case. It's a beautifully well-made um, comforter. And I think there are probably some interesting secrets to be found in these names here. Um, it would just be a, a lot of research time to, um, to really delve into it and to try to determine um, the, the, the relationships between all the people on the quilts. My best guess is that this quilt comforter does probably date from the 1880s, um, maybe a tiny bit later. Did you happen to see a Benjamin Peer? Actually, the piers are on there, yes. Oh, you live on Pier Street. Yeah, yeah. they're on here. In the farm, yeah. Cool. Is that your house? Is your house a pier? My house houses are on what? At his old, um, um, old farm, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, there are definitely piers on this, on this coverlet. All right, so we are so delighted to have the recent gift um, from the, the um, Matthews family. Um, and it's my understanding that the clothing in this gift belonged to a Margaret Quick, who was a Quaker. Um, the family was, was Quaker. Um, and Bill had an interesting question for me when he was showing me these pieces. Um, Besides the three bonnets that I've brought here tonight, there are also, there's also a very nice 19 teens dress, there's a beautiful cape, there's a really interesting 19 teens coat, as well as some other pieces. And Bill says, but these aren't plain, these look a little fancy to me. And um, I just wanted to address for a moment the idea of Quaker plain dressing. Um, certainly when the, the meeting house, the Menden meeting, was established here in around 1835, um, the habit of dressing plain and, and the, the, the purpose of dressing plain for Quakers was still very much in effect. Um, what they meant by plain dressing wasn't necessarily um, boring dressing or, or, or dressing that was less than other people, but it tended to be monochromatic it tended to be um, not devoid of ornamentation, but less ornamentation than people who were not dressing plain. Um, it also tended to be made of the very, very finest materials that a family could afford. Um, the idea was, um, was, was, to, was to pare down, but to still be very uh, fashion forward in terms of the shape of the clothing and the, the quality of the fabrics. By 1900, and probably even a little bit before that, the idea of plain dressing was really leaving the Quaker um, communities. Part of the reason was that they felt that the, um, 
the concentration or the, 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 the worry and the concentration of, of keeping playing was keeping people from their more um, serious moral concerns. That they were kind of wound up in this idea of, oh my gosh, I have to, I have to be this way, I have to do this, rather than molding, molding their behavior and their, their um, morality toward their religious precepts. So by 1901, there were a lot of publications that were exhorting uh, or, or being proponents of not dressing plain for Quakers. Um, so it's not surprising, I think, to have these pieces of clothing from the Menden Quaker meeting um, to not be plain. Um, I would still argue that they were plainer than probably some other people, but you know that, or maybe it was just personal taste. But there are two bonnets in this collection, as well as a bonnet cover. And I have to say that the bonnet cover is a very rare thing, but let's get to the bonnets first. Um, this is a very beautiful plum-colored silk. It's, um, it's built on a frame of, of probably raffia or, or, or grapevine or some other um, wooden or reed um, that holds the shape of the bonnet. It has buckram on the inside to help keep it stiff. It's very much a shape from the 1880s, um, so I'm guessing that that's when it would date to. Um, truly beautiful piece. Um, reminiscent of Quaker plain dress in its very simple ornamentation and its relatively dark color and really fine fabrics. It, it's, it's a delight and it's in really terrific condition. So that's um, something to be very, very pleased to have added to the collection. This bonnet is something that I really, I have never seen one quite like this before. Um, the fabric, again, is a super, super fine, lightweight wool. Um, it's definitely, to my opinion, a summer bonnet with that long curtain in the back to help protect from the sun. Um, I know, lightweight wool on your head in the summer, that makes no <laughs> sense, but... Um, it is extremely lightweight. When I was handling it, it it's just like a feather. It, it would, it, it, the breezes would go right through that. I, I don't think that it would be a heat problem at all. It is also in really, really terrific condition. It's a beautiful piece. Um, and then finally, there's this super interesting bonnet cover. And to be honest, I've only ever seen one other bonnet cover. Uh, I'm sure others exist, and just the fact that I've only seen two doesn't really mean a lot, but I have only seen two. And this one um, appears to be made of glazed cotton. And uh, glazed cotton was a fabric um, that was finished in the manufacturing process to be slightly waterproof um, and to have a beautiful shine to it. Um, it also had a really kind of a stiff texture, a stiff body. So it was perfect for things like the backs of men's vests and um, the, the, the linings of women's skirt hems and things like that. Um, it used to be made from glazed cotton, but, but when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. It, it does have a resistance to water and it holds up really well in the elements. Um, it looks like it was made to go over a bonnet of about the same time period as the first one I showed you, the plum. Um, silk um, and just to cover it in inclement weather. Um, it might be a summer day that's going to be very rainy and you have to go out and you could cover it up almost like rubbers for your shoes. Um, so that this piece and it's in great condition too is, is very very unique and something very um, very wonderful to have added to the collection here and to know that it belonged to a specific family that had its roots right here um, is, is really a, a plus. You know, you can be very, very, very proud of that. All right, next. Okay, so I never talk about clothing unless I talk about underclothing. I'm sorry, if anybody <laughs> takes offense, just go, feel free to, to, to leave. I'm sorry. I am very fond of, um, of women's stays and corsets and because I think that to understand that underpinning allows you to understand the shape of the garment that goes over it and the shape of the woman underneath. Um, this piece has actually been on exhibit in the Historical Society for quite a while now, I believe. And um, 
I believe it was also misidentified. I can't remember right now what the label said about it, but it is definitely a teenager's stay from probably the 1820s. Um, stays in that time period were meant to be a, a, a good basis for, for, um, for fitting all of the rest of your clothes over, but not meant to be constricting. They were very rarely, or, or not heavily boned. So unlike, and I'll show you some pictures of, of earlier stays, unlike both earlier and later stays that had very heavy boning, these ones might have um, a little bit of structure to the top and a little bit of structure around the hip. But other than that, there was not a lot that was really um, constricting. They were never, ever meant to cut off your breathing or make you not want to eat. Um, they were meant to give your garments a good foundation to, uh, to, to fit to. And uh, these ones, uh, stays of this shape, would definitely give you um, it, 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 they would give you some curve, and they would, they would, because they come down low on the hip, though, it would also just sort of smooth out that whole line to make it look really great. Um, I do have it up there on that, on that very poor little mannequin right there. Um, it, it's, it's a really great example. It's hard to tell from the size of it. I would guess it's an early teenage girl. Um, even in the 1820s, people were putting their fairly young daughters into stays. If you look earlier, um, certainly in medieval times and through the 18th century, the girls as young as three or four were starting to wear stays, and it wasn't, it wasn't a torture device. It was just meant as body training. It was meant to ensure that you had good posture, and it was meant to ensure that your clothes fit properly. Um, and in fact, um, when women are, are are wearing stays from the time that they're young, if they go out of stays, they find themselves um, weakened and, and unsupported. So it can actually be a good thing. Um, next slide. This is just a shot at the back. Um, this one is made with really beautiful, commercially produced ivory eyelets, uh, which is pretty typical in the 1820s, but it's a really beautiful touch. The workmanship on this particular stay is, is, is not perfect, but it's very, very good. There's a little bit of decorative quality to it. I hope you um, take a closer look at it. Um, I've also brought a couple reproduction stays for you guys to look at and play with a little bit if you like. Um, and just as a comparison, this slide shows stays that are probably 1770s. So if you think about the time of the American Revolution, you think about the clothing of that time period, um, you're looking at a very conical shape. Um, a woman's torso was meant to be wide at the shoulders, small at the, at the waist, and then go down, but not, not rounded in, in the sense that we think of rounded bodies today. It was definitely meant to be a cone shape. And without this stay, it would have been almost impossible to fit the tightly fitted bodices of gowns at that time period. You would have been working over lumps and bumps and all kinds of things that shift around and, and it just would not have been able to ever have the, the, the silhouette that was, um, that was considered the epitome of beauty at that time. Next one. And then also after our set of 1820s stays, um, this is a set of 1850s or 60s and you see again the very heavily boned um, heavily boned material, but in much more of an hourglass shape. Um, in the 1850s and 60s, women were definitely not going for conical, they were going for rounded. Rounded above and also rounded um, below the hip. So this day would have, um, would have created that shape for them. Um, as Drew mentioned, I am a reenactor, so I brought a couple pairs of my stays just in case anyone wants to like hold them up and see what they feel like. Um, and just like that 1770s one that we saw earlier, these are my 1770s stays. I haven't worn them in ages, so they probably don't fit anymore, but I think they'll give you a good idea of the fact that they are pretty stiff and they would definitely hold you into a certain shape but they were never meant to be drawn so tight 
to actually like make you smaller. They just wanted to mold what was there into the shape that was popular. And so the idea of trying of of you know trying to go down to an 18 inch waist or trying to go down to it, it just wasn't a feature of the time period. That's a very much a Hollywood idea. So these are the earliest days that I brought. These ones are a rack. I've worn them to death. Uh, <laughs> these ones are slightly later. Oh gosh, they are really bad. Um, these are slightly later. These are more like 1790s. And again, it's still a very conical shape. They're a little bit less heavily boned. Um, things were starting to, to loosen up a little bit in this time period. And you'll notice that they're also shorter in the waist. Um, the waist of dresses were coming up, so there wasn't as much need to control what was lower down. So this set of stays is definitely 1790s, 1800. And then we get the empire period. The, the, uh, which is my favorite because it's so comfortable. Um, and I have to admit that in terms of, in, in terms of my stays, I'm fairly fortunate because um, I don't need a lot of boning. Uh, I've always had fairly good posture and I don't have a lot to hold in. So um, this set of stays would be a little bit unusual in the 18 teens, but um, someone with a build similar to mine would find these very, very comfortable and appropriate. It's very bra-like actually. Um, meant to sort of, sort of hold uh, everything above, uh, hold everything so that it stays right below the bust line, um, and then and then that's that's it with these ones. You don't get any boning. You just you just have a very lightweight, very comfortable. Um, I can't imagine if a woman had been born in 1790. Well, if a woman had been an adolescent in 1790 and grew up wearing these. And then suddenly, in the 18 teens, these became available. It would have been like, oh, thank you, thank you. Because even though these are not terribly constricting, you still definitely feel the difference between the types of um, of undergarments. Um, then, in a close approximation, actually, of our 1820s, um, this is a stay that I wear for 1820s through 1840s. And the only boning in it at all is this center busk. And this just helps, uh, it, it helps your posture because you really can't bend or slouch too much. Um, but there's, there's basically nothing else. The cording, well, oh, I'm sorry, I do have a little bit of boning in the back as well. The cording is not just decorative, the cording actually does help stiffen the fabric a little bit as well. These ones are extremely comfortable too. Um, and, and because waistlines are lowering, they're starting to get back down over the hips. And in fact, these ones go um, probably hit, hit me mid-hip, um, which, which helps with the clothing from that time period as well. So these are the closest to the example that you have. So clearly somebody has to dress you. Um, strangely enough, I can wiggle into these. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to do it. I've had to do it. But if you think about um, women even in the 1820s in America with uh, their husband, theoretically a husband around, and probably a couple kids, I mean, this is, this is your older daughter's task or your husband's task to get you into your stays in the morning. <laughs> How do they keep all these bulky things underneath from showing through your dress? Um, that's a great question. Most of the dresses, okay. So in this time period, when you're wearing this very, very lightweight stay, this is also the time period when you have the lightest weight fabrics that you're wearing and the fewest other undergarments. So if you're wearing these, the bodice of your dress is going to be fully lined. And the bodice of your dress is also going to help keep everything in place. Yeah. Exactly. Because this first one you shed, there's a lot of gingerbread on the bottom. <laughs> sure. This is this at the hip is never going to show because you are going to have on uh, probably three or four petticoats, oh. and so that's not going to be an issue at all. Honestly, with this style stay, your biggest problem is is the the neckline. Um, so you have to be sure that your shift and your gown necklines are cut to cover that. 
That's a great question, Dee. Thank you. Um, and then finally, um, 1850s. These don't really fit me very well at all. <laughs> they were a mistake. But um, <laughs> it's okay. Um, but these, these, these are back to being fairly heavily boned. Um, they have a lot of cording around the hip because um, in the 1850s you're still wearing lots of petticoats. So this cording is going to help support all those petticoats. One great innovation is that they clasp in the front and lace in the back. So you would, you would put them on and, and adjust the lacing in the back to the point that you want it to be. And then every time you take them off, you just take them off from the front. And you shouldn't really have to adjust the lacing in the back very much after that. Or, you know, if you're having one of those days, you can open them up in the back a little bit, or you can pull them a little bit tighter. Um, but again, these, these are not meant, you know, you think about Scarlett O'Hara and, and being, yeah, and that's just really not the purpose of these. The purpose is to give you good posture and to give you a really strong underpinning to build your garments on and to to show the, um, the silhouette that was uh, popular at the time. Okay, I've run through all my slides. I've showed you all my underwear. <laughs> I'm not sure what else I can do. Um, I just want to thank you all for being here. I'd be happy to answer questions. Um, I think that Honey Eye Falls is very blessed to have such a great collection and to have it in such good hands as your trustees and your curator emeritus. Um, and it's been a real delight to work in it, even the little bit that I have. Um, it's been it, it's been a real pleasure. So, does anybody have any questions? Wouldn't you? <laughs> wouldn't you have chemises underneath? Yes, absolutely. You don't want those right, right up against your skin. skin. So you have the chemise and then that, and then uh, the pantaloons. Well, of sorts. I love it when people ask underwear questions. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so drawers right. or pantalettes didn't yeah. really come into play for women until about the 1830s. So before the 1830s, you've got your shift, you've got your stockings, you've got your stays. You've got numerous petticoats, and that's it. Well, makes some things easier. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, so yes, you were talking about multiple layers. And then, about the time of these stays, you do start to get the cage crinolines, which are made of spring steel. And they are lightweight, and they will hold your skirts out beautifully without multiple petticoats. So um, women said, oh, this is awesome. We can make skirts even bigger now because we have these cage crinolines. And that's one of, one of the reasons why dresses became so large in the 1860s. Also that the decoration of dresses just exploded around that same time period because sewing machines were suddenly affordable. And so putting trim on dresses was no longer an onerous task of running up hand hemming yards of ruffles. You could hem it on your sewing machine and throw those babies on there in hours rather than days. Charles. Um, without having you get into a full presentation on preservation, <laughs> um, so I've seen you know a cardboard toilet paper box full of clothes in the attic from the 60s. You pull it out and if they escape insect damage they're kind of brown and yellow and not in great shape. So how is something like the bonnet that you said was in really good shape, most likely stored to have lasted that long by an individual? Is it kind of luck or...? or <laughs> Sometimes it is luck. I, I'm a firm believer in that because I, I know I have seen things come out of attics and come out of you know acidic wooden trunks in perfect condition. But these may have been taken care of a lot better. You know, what... <clears throat> what I like to recommend to people who have things like this in their own collections is that they, they, they take care of them to the best of their abilities. It's good to remove, to obviously pests are a problem, light is a problem, dust is a problem, and acid is a problem. So if you can remove a couple of those issues, it, it's going to help. Um, I would love it if everybody could afford acid-free boxes to put their pieces in, but that's unrealistic. Um, and actually one of the best things you can do is 
buy a lot of white cotton um, sheets at yard sales and wrap your things up things up in white cotton sheets because that will keep the acids away. It will keep them um, away from light and dirt. And it won't do much about moths, but it's, that's three out of four. It's <laughs> so, <laughs> not too bad. Yes, sir? Completely naive question from someone who never has thought about such things, but going to stays for a second. Would the average homemaker or farm wife in the 19th century have been wearing these things on an everyday basis? That is such an age-old question. And as a reenactor, I get asked that question all the time. And I think that in most parts of America, and most parts of like Western Europe, I would say yes. Um, they may not have been made by professional stay makers. They may have been made at home. Um, they wouldn't have necessarily been worn for the heaviest work, like maybe not on laundry day, maybe not during haying. Although you see lots and lots of paintings of women doing haying, and they definitely have stays on. Um, yeah, there's, well, and part of that too, so, so let's just go back a second, because remember I said that they help you with your posture? They also help you with back support. And so, in a sense, they're very supportive and helpful. Um, I know that if I'm working over a fire and I've got a lot of cast iron that I'm moving around, I'm grateful for that. Um, so my answer is generally yes. You see a lot of, um, you do see references in the South of, of women going without stays. There was one man in particular, Charles Woodmason, was an, a, uh, an Episcopal minister. And he traveled through the South, and he just wrote scathing, scathing things about the way Southerners dressed. And women were coming to church in just shifts and one petticoat. And the men were coming without neckerchiefs and bare feet and just scathing. Um, but there's a lot of thought now that he was writing to a particular audience back in England who wanted to hear that America was full of savage people. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. But if you look at a lot of period diaries and period letters, you do see a lot of reference to wearing stays all the time. And a related question, if I could just finish up. Sure. For a young mother with multiple small children that she's constantly picking up and carrying, or if she's pregnant, mm -hmm. would that impact upon being able to do this? It might. There, um, there are some examples of stays that we think were gestational stays for during pregnancy. Um, and in fact, there's a couple patterns for those available to reenactors. But um, I, think, I think the picking up young children thing would not have been an issue. Nursing can be an issue uh, with, with stays. Um, I've done it, and uh, it was not easy, but it was doable. Um, I think we also kind of need to remember that our idea of comfort might not have been their idea of comfort, and our idea of what is, what is necessary uh, to be proper is different from what people in the past thought was necessary to be proper. So um, I, I, I think that it's hard for us to sometimes imagine ourselves in their place. Um, there, yeah. So I haven't done a lot of research on that, but but I, I, I think in general it was considered still the thing. Good question. Well, you mentioned laundry day. How were these clothes cared for? They couldn't have washed them very often and still had them keep their shape and colors. You're exactly right. Um, and both women's and men's clothing, the things that are closest to your body were made of white linen or white cotton. So men's shirts, women's shifts, when they started wearing drawers, their drawers, um, were all made of white linen or white cotton, which are very easy to launder. And you can actually boil the heck out of them and get them really clean. But outer garments were generally left out to air, uh, brushed often, especially woolen clothing was brushed to get residue and stuff off of it. Um, it. There was much, much less laundering of outer garments, but frequent laundering of your undergarments. And that was how they got through. Um, silk was hardly ever laundered at all. We, we don't launder silk today either. Um, 
linen, linen outer garments were easier to wash than, uh, than the wool, obviously, and they may have been washed more often as well. But um, people took care of their clothing in a very different way. Um, they had less clothing too than we do today. You know, the, if you look at inventories um, taken at the time of people's passing, the numbers of garments that they had were much lower, but my, my feeling is, and, and the feeling of other people, is that they were just replaced a lot more frequently too. Um, linen, if you think about 18th century clothing and so much of it being linen, linen is extremely sturdy, and so is wool, obviously, and so the clothing didn't tend to wear out as, as uh, frequently as ours did do, as our clothing does. <laughs> Sorry. So that's, that's it. The outer clothing was aired and brushed and underclothing cleaned. Yes, is there a, when you say the stays, were these sewn in like, um, I've heard that some of it was bone mm -hmm. stays. Um, are, were they, they wood or different <laughs> materials? Um, <clears throat> that changed over time. So if you're thinking about 18th century women's stays like this pair, it was most likely either a flat reed, or actually even bundles of reed in there, or um, baleen, which is whale, a, a, a product from whales. Um, as you went along, it started to get a little bit more toward uh, thin shavings of, not thin shavings of wood, but thin bits of wood, um, which is a problem too, because the wooden ones would tend to, the baleen was great because baleen warms up when it's against you, and so it would actually kind of move with you. Wood doesn't do that as much, and it can actually, and it snaps, um, and that's very uncomfortable. <laughs> so yeah, so the, chan the channels were sewn, and then the stuff was stuffed down in there. What about bustles? Bustles, um, we're generally, so bustles came after the great hoop skirt period. So we already have spring steel, which is what made hoop skirts possible. So they used that same spring steel to build little things that came out here in the back. They gave you a shelf, basically. Um, <laughs> right? um, so, and they were often made, there were lots and lots of patents for bustles because they needed to be somewhat collapsible. A hoop skirt isn't hard to sit in. You just need to swing it the right way as you're going down. But bustles can be very difficult because of the way they're built. So they, there were lots of patents for how to make them collapsible. Um, the, the nature form, natural form dress often had a small bustle. But when you see some of the Victorian bustles from like the, um, the early 1880s toward the mid 1880s, they are real engineering feats. They're, they're amazing, and, and they, they literally build a shelf back there. And that's one of those periods where they talk about women almost being like upholstered because their, their clothing fit so perfectly to their corseted and bustled bodies that it wouldn't, it, there was no budge. It just fit so perfectly. And also the layers of ornamentation were so intricate and so almost overwhelming, like a piece of Victorian furniture. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Sewn, and so is the 1840s dress. Um, sewing machines were being developed in the 1830s, but they weren't really very viable for most people until a little bit later than that. So, so yeah, and none of these pieces have like a. Um, a dressmaker's label or anything right, in them, yeah. so they may have been made at home, most likely. Anyone else? Okay, well, thanks for coming out tonight.